and welcome to the Endocrine Society's first Endo 2022 news conference. For the first time in three years, we're really excited to have journalists joining us in person in Atlanta as well as virtually. My name is Jenny Glenn Gingery. I'm the Director of Communications and Media Relations for the Endocrine Society. Today we'll be exploring the latest research on endocrine disrupting chemicals. We're pleased to have with us Dr. Lindsay S. Trevino of City of Hope, a cancer research and treatment organization in Los Angeles, California, and Dr. P.S. Mohan Kumar, professor at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. So for the next 30 minutes or so, each of our speakers is gonna present their findings, and then we'll finish up with a question and answer session at the end. Please note that this news conference is being broadcast live via webcast, and that there are many journalists joining us online right now. Because we're broadcasting via the web, it's important that any remarks that you make during today's session are made into a microphone so that everyone who's joining us virtually can hear. Journalists who are attending online, um, please feel free to type your questions into the chat window as we go along and we will get those answered for you when we get to the question and answer session. So I would now like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Trevino, to speak. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it is very uh, nice to be here to share our findings uh, with you today, and I'm hap I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have and during the question and answer session. So the work um, that we've been doing in the lab relates to paraben exposure and um, their effects on uh, breast cancer cells, particularly luminal breast cancer cells. And so I will be telling you more about this project today. I have nothing to disclose. The if you don't remember anything from this uh, from this little talk, I want you to remember that this came um, this project came out of the community. It came out of community concerns, and so this is um, an initiative that I'm involved with called the Bench to Community Initiative. I'm one of the um, principal investigators, and my um, colleague Dr. Dedetete is uh, the other principal investigator of this Bench to Community Initiative. So she's a social behavioral scientist. I'm a basic researcher, and so together we've put together a multidisciplinary team to tackle um, this issue from the um, perspective of social behavioral sciences, community-based participatory research, as well as laboratory research. And um, pictured below um, our pictures here um, are our community advisory board. And so this community advisory board is comprised of um, different people from different backgrounds who have a stake in this um, issue, including um, stylists and salon owners, um, so T Tanya Fairley also has her own line of products, um, and Maggie Hawkins is a community engagement and health educator and also involved in policy. Bing Turner is a health educator, and Tia Tomlin Harris is a breast cancer survivor, um, and also the co-founder of the organization, uh, the uh, My Style Matters. And so um, I just want to put that out there that they came to me with the question of how, what do we know about parabens and uh, personal care products and, and hair products. And when we looked into the literature, I found that we don't know a lot in terms of um, how it impacts um, communities of color particularly. And we have here the QR code for our website, um, the Bench to Community website that has more information about us and our initiatives. So what do we know about breast cancer risk and endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EDCs? So I, I want to highlight that um, there are breast cancer disparities, um, unfortunately. Incidence rates are higher among uh, black women than white women, uh, particularly under the age of 45, and some uh, statistics will say age 40 even. Um, black women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with triple negative disease, which is um, a very aggressive disease that is um, typically difficult to treat. Um, compared to women of other racial and ethnic groups. And breast cancer death rates are about 40% higher in black women compared to white women. So um, this is a, an issue that really needs to be tackled um, because too many um, women of color are, are, and black women in particular, um, are being diagnosed with and dying from, from this disease. And we know that there's a growing body of literature that chemicals that act as endocrine disruptors or that disrupt the uh, hormone system may contribute to breast cancer development. And so this is just a, a schematic to remind us what are the endocrine um, organs and, and systems that are important that could be impacted by endocrine disrupting chemicals. So my lab is focused right now on looking at parabens, which is a class of chemicals that has been used as preservatives in cosmetic and personal care products since the 1920s. And so 
Um, they make sure that the, you know, your face cream won't go bad <laughs> and can have a long shelf life. Um, so, so basically that's all that they do um, in, in these products, but it turns out that, th that these parabens have been detected in nearly all urine samples taken from adults in the United States. So it's, the usage is very ubiquitous, so we're all exposed. And there are a lot of studies that have shown that the more personal care products you use, the higher the measurement of paraben levels. Um, so there's an additive effect, and, and there are also studies that have shown like they act like estrogen in the body. And so the Environmental Working Group um, has this scale um, of chemical uh, compounds where they have worst, meaning the most hazardous, to the best, meaning the least hazardous. So they have this scale from one to 10. And parabens fall somewhere in the middle to the high end, depending on the type of paraben. So I told you this is a class of chemicals, so there are different types of parabens. My lab is focused on looking at three different types, uh, butylparaben, propylparaben, and methylparaben. And both butylparaben and propylparaben are um, high, highly hazardous. They have, uh, they're on the scale of nine. Um, of, on this scale, and methylparaben is um, a three to four, depending on which uh, which product you're looking at and the usage. So these are pretty um, hazardous chemicals, and they're the ones that are typically found in the cosmetic and personal care products. And um, something that I really hadn't appreciated before, um, but we know um, based on research, is that personal care products marketed to black women contain a lot of hazardous chemicals. Um, compared to um, other products that are just general market. Um, so in particular, they contain parabens as well. So the EWG, or the Environmental Working Group, also did this study where they looked at the high, the uh, products marketed to black women and they looked for ingredients of concern, so the most highly hazardous uh, chemicals. And propylparaben, methylparaben, and butylparaben popped up as being you know, in the top list of ingredients of concern. and, and being the most frequently found um, in these products marketed to black women. So we can see here that we have a, an, an issue of disparities, right? So black women are at higher risk of getting, uh, developing breast cancer, aggressive breast cancer, and also dying from breast cancer. And then they are also um, being exposed to um, these chemicals at, at higher um, rates or having higher exposures because of the products that they use and, and, and the, you know, they start using these products early on as well, like very young. And so you're seeing this, um, why maybe looking at these two things in conjunction are very important. So there have been studies in breast cancer cell lines, so in vitro, in the laboratory, in a dish, um, that have shown that parabens can impact breast cancer cells. And so this is just a slide that shows a summary of what it, what the paraben effects can be in cell lines in a dish. Um, and so they can cause uh, cells to grow. They can, they can cause cells to um, uh, evade cell death pathways. So they, they're like, okay, I'm just gonna keep growing and I'm not gonna listen to, to any pa signal for me to stop growing. Um, they've also been shown to be associated with uh, invasion and metastasis of these cells. Um, but the caveat and the issue here is that all of these studies were conducted with breast cancer cell lines of European ancestry. So I just gave this whole background about why it's important to study diverse um, patients and um, then when we go and we look at what the studies have actually done in the laboratory, we're not doing that. And so um, we, I mean, basically we ask the very simple question. And so what happens in when you treat diverse cell lines with these parabens? Um, because we know that there are effects of parabens in breast cancer cells, but we don't know what happens if the cell lines are actually diverse. So um, I'm just gonna focus on two cell lines that we've used in the lab right now. Um, we're doing some studies with some other lines, but just for brevity, I'm gonna focus on MCF7, which is um, a, of European ancestry. So you know, if you do the, the, the genotyping, you find that it's a, a white cell line, basically. And the MCF7 has been used, this cell line has been used historically you know, since forever. And so this is a good, line, a good cell line to use as a kind of a control, because we have all this data. Um, and the, what I showed you on the previous slide, they've done those 
those studies in MC with MCF7. So this is a good kind of control. And so we've also added the HCC 1500 cell line, um, which um, is West African, um, has West African ancestry. And so I'll be showing the comparison between these two cell lines for the different um, outcomes that we measured. So the first thing that we did was we looked at cell viability or cell survival. Um, so what do the parabens do on the, the survival of these cells? And so we used concentrations of uh, parabens. Here I'm just focusing on butyl paraben because we didn't see much of an effect with propyl paraben or methyl paraben. So we used different doses of butyl paraben that um, are in physiological range, meaning that when we take samples from um, women and from uh, adults across the United States and across the globe, these ranges are pretty much uh, within what we find when we do measurements in, in human samples. So we find that in this range, in the MCF7 cells, there's not much of, there's no increase of cell viability or cell survival. But when we look at the HCC 1500 cell line, we can see that at this particular dose, we have um, a very uh, a robust increase in cell viability um, of this cell line, in this cell line. We also looked at um, expression of estrogen-regulated genes in these cell lines when treated with parabens. So estrogen signaling is important for breast cancer development and progression. So we wanted to know um, what the effects of parabens would be on the target genes of the estrogen signaling pathway. And with um, the MCF7 cell line here, I'm showing one example of one of the genes that we looked at. We can see um, methyl par uh, butyl paraben in yellow and propyl paraben in green, that we do see uh, an increase in the expression of this particular gene in the MCF7 um, cell line when we treat with either butyl paraben or propyl paraben, um, but we see a more robust increase. Um, in the HCC 1500 cell line, and it's very it's very comparable to what we see with estradiol, which is the na the natural hormone. So that's what we used as a comparison. So I mean, in this case, we can see that we have a bigger effect again in the HCC 1500 cell line than in the MCF7 cell line. So to summarize, kind of what I've shown you today, the HCC 1500 or black breast cancer cell line may be more sensitive to parabens. And we have two lines of evidence of that, that butyl paraben increases the cell viability of the HCC 1500, but not MCF7. And the increase in the estrogen-regulated gene expression was more robust in the HCC 1500 cells treated with either butyl paraben or propyl paraben. And again, methyl paraben had no effect um, on the estrogen-regulated genes. And so this brings me to my second point, even though I didn't show data for this, Butyl paraben and propyl paraben may be more tumorigenic, or they may they may be more harmful um, in the context of breast cancer, um, because we saw these effects um, on the survivor, the survival, and also on the gene expression with these two, but not with methyl paraben. And so, remember, if you if you recall one of my first slides with the scale, methyl paraben is actually three to four on the hazard scale, and butyl paraben and propyl paraben are a nine. So this this data falls in line with that very well. Um, and with that, I would like to just acknowledge the people in my lab who've done the work. Um, again, my um, colleague, Dr. Dede Tete at Chapman University, and other, uh, the Community Advisory Board again, and then other um, collaborators who have uh, provided input on this project are sources of funding. And I also have here um, three QR codes for um, people who might be wondering, how do I know what are in my products and how, you know, what, where do I go to? What resources do I, do I find um, to be able to reduce my exposure? In case you're wondering, um, there are different applications. Think Dirty, um, and then the one in the middle is the EWG. I've mentioned the EWG. Um, they have a skin deep database. Um, and then Clearia is a newer one where it's a, an application that when you're online shopping, you know, and you're putting something in your cart or whatever, it'll tell you, whoops, like maybe you don't want to use that because that has this or that. Here are some other, um, some alternatives. So I've just provided these QR codes for, for your information. So thank you very much for your um, attention and I'll be happy to answer questions during Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Trevino. I'd now like to call up Dr. Mohan Kumar. Greetings, everyone. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Trevino. It's a nice talk, excellent talk, and you did a lot of introduction that uh, I need to do, so that, that's great. That helps me. So today what we're going to be... Into the microphone? Oh. Can you raise, raise it up if you want? Okay. So today what I'm going to be discussing is basically sex and dose dependent effects of uh, two other uh, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So these are going to be BPA and phthalates basically. So that's what we're going to be talking about. While this particular paper focuses on the behavior and uh, brain neurotransmitters, uh, our lab has also done uh, quite a bit of work on other systems. So we're going to be talking about that also a little bit just to give you a taste of what it might be doing. So disclosure, we do not have anything to disclose in terms of financial or other conflicts of interest. So let me just hit the conclusions first. That way you can look at the conclusions and we can go into the study. So the conclusions, as you can see here, prenatal exposure, so we are basically exposing moms who are pregnant to BPA and DHP individually or in combination as a mixture. And we see that it adversely impacts anxiety-related behaviors in a sex and dose-dependent manner. Okay. So these behavioral alterations that we see are associated with changes in catecholamine levels, specifically dopamine levels, in uh, specific areas of the brain that are known to be involved in regulation, regulating stress axis, okay? So that was the study that I'm gonna be talking about. So this is from the couple other studies that we have done. So you can see that high dose uh, phthalates can affect thymus and alternatives for BPA such as BPF and BPS, they can be affecting uh, the reproductive system as well as the cardiovascular system. So we're going to just touch upon those also just to give you a complete picture of what is going on with these chemicals. Okay, so again, I don't have to belabor this point and Dr. Trevino has nicely given an introduction. So these are a different class of chemicals, but again, uh, endocrine disrupting come under the broad, broad umbrella for endocrine disrupting chemicals and bisphenol A, as pretty much all of you might know already, it's an estrogenic endocrine disrupting chemical. It uses the estrogen receptors as well as sometimes aryl hydrocarbon receptors. And phthalates, on the other hand, uh, these both are plasticizers and DHP or phthalates are also used in personal care products. So they can cross the blood brain barrier, I mean um, uh, placental barrier, and then they can affect the uh, organization basically of brain and other organs basically as they are developing. And so what we are trying to show here is the impact of prenatal exposure to these chemicals and behavior and brain neurotransmitters. Okay, so our hypothesis was basically prenatal exposure to BPA and DHP at different doses will alter anxiety-related behaviors and transmitters, neurotransmitters in a sex-specific manner. So we want to look at how do males and females respond really, and that was the main uh, goal. So just to give you a quick idea on how we did the study, so uh, pregnant uh, moms uh, were administered EDCs uh, through day six to 21 of pregnancy. So we had multiple groups, as you can see, control group and a BPA and a DHP, and there are two doses of DHP. We have one low dose and a high dose, and then a BPA in combination of a low dose DHP and BPA in combination of a high dose DHP is what we did. The doses, all the doses that we use here are extremely environmentally relevant, for example, the NOEL for uh, BPA is five milligram per kg body weight, and for DHP is 4.8 milligram per kg body weight. Okay, whereas your tolerable total daily intake for BPA is 50 microgram per kg body weight, and uh, for, uh, for DHP is 20 microgram per kg body weight. So, a pretty uh, pretty environmentally relevant and lower than what is even prescribed by regulatory organizations. So we, we used both male and female offspring, so the moms were treated, but we did not look at the moms. So we were following the offspring, basically, so we were looking at males and females, and we administered what is known as a shock probe defensive burying test, is what we did. And, and then we looked at the uh, neurotransmitter levels in the offspring using high-performance liquid chromatography. So this is just to give you an idea how this uh, test looks like. You can see there is a probe there that provides a very small current, and when an animal touches it, it's going to produce a mild shock. Okay, then the behavior that you measure, uh, because it is adverse for the animal, they try to cover the probe with, uh, you know, the, the materials and stuff. And then sometimes, you know, they cannot cope up with the shock, so they are kind of like not able to move. They just stand there. And then 
how do they respond to the shock, the reactivity time? So all those are the behavioral measures that we looked at. Okay, now let us uh, hit the results. So you can see on the left side of the panel, you will see your males, and on the right side, you're gonna have the females there. So on the left side, you, we are showing in the males, we have the burying time. You can see all endocrine disrupting chemicals, except the mixed ones, the low dose ones, they show a significant decrease in burying time, meaning once they receive the shock, they are not burying, basically, meaning they're not responding to it appropriately. Okay, then if you look at the females, it's a little different. What we are looking at there is shock reactivity. How do they even react to shock? Their reactivity to shock is significantly reduced in females. Okay, so you can see these endocrine disrupting chemicals, when the moms are uh, exposed to these chemicals, and the offspring, how they respond to uh, adverse situations is completely altered in these animals, okay? So male offspring show a decreased active defense mechanism, and female offspring show decreased physical reaction to the shock. Okay, some, some other behavioral effects, again, if you can see here, so you can see immobility time, you can see just the low dose of DHP alone, there is an increase in immobility time, so it's get, just doesn't know what to do, it's just stalled, basically, in the cage, it's not producing any reaction. Whereas on the other hand, if you look at the females, you can see a variety of response, even with BPA, DHP, low dose, the combination, and things like that, okay? So endocrine dis disruptors, low dose ones specifically increase passive coping in male and female offspring is what we observed in this study. Okay, so this is, uh, this is just an example of dopamine levels in paraventricular nucleus. As you know, paraventricular nucleus has this corticotropin releasing hormone cell body. So these are the har this is the hormone that's critically responsible for uh, the stress axis activation. And neurotransmitters coming into PVN will regulate the stress response. And you can see there is a significant decrease in dopamine levels coming into PVN. Just to give you a quick idea, where do they get this dopamine uh, innervation? They get it from a specific area called incertohypothalamic dopaminergic system. So that's where they get it from. And you can see there's a significant increase and incertohypothalamic dopaminergic system has been known to be uh, involved in regulating lots of behavioral responses. So you can see there is a significant decrease there in the males. Okay, so those are the effects that we saw with the behavioral study. I'm just going to touch upon a little bit on the effects on the immune system with the same model, same dose, everything. You can see there are, in the females, where you don't see any changes there, whereas in the uh, males, you see significant alterations in thymus weight, which is shown on the left side there of the panel. On the right side, on top and bottom, you see the cortex uh, apoptotic uh, index and the medulla apoptotic index, and you can see significant differences there. Just to give you a taste of what it could be doing to the immune system that's happening there. And here is the effects on the reproductive organs. You can see there is a male anogenital distance is going to be uh, affected. In, the, in this study, we are uh, comparing the effects of BPA along with alternatives for BPA, the so-called alternatives, which are supposed to be safe. That's what they say. So here is BPS and BPF. You can see significant differences there also. And you can see the ovaries are also affected. And uh, doses, uh, high doses of BPF can really cause abortions, significant increase in abortion rates. So these are very serious, significant effects associated with the reproductive functions of BPA analogs, basically. And again, this is an, another example, and this is presented, I think, day after tomorrow, and in this endocrine meeting, and we are presenting the effects of uh, these chemicals on the cardiovascular function. So these animals were uh, implanted with telemeters. So telemeters, that way you don't touch the animal or anything. You can uh, monitor the blood pressure every second and things like that. So your uh, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure can be easily seen. You can see male and female there, and there are significant differences associated with uh, prenatal exposure to these chemicals on blood pressure in these animals. Again, indicating that this pretty much affects every system that you can think of. So again, to repeat the conclusion, after we did this in the beginning, prenatal exposure to BPA and phthalates adversely impacts anxiety-related behaviors in a sex and dose-dependent manner. And these behavioral alterations could be associated with changes that we observe in neurotransmitters, specifically dopamine, in stress-regulating uh, uh, areas of the brain. And again, uh, these exposure to these chemicals can affect multiple organ systems. We have provided some taste of what's happening in the immune system as well as the reproductive system and the cardiovascular functions. 
Thank you. And again, I'll take any questions and answers when we do the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohan Kumar. Um, I'm now going to go ahead and um, open it up for questions. Um, if you're in the room, just uh, wait till we come around with the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is for uh, Dr. Trevino. Great presentation. Um, I'm Mike Nasha from Endocrine Today. Um, I noticed, um, I think it was in the press release, that there's fewer, um, or black women are less likely to use paraben-free options. Um, so it, for, the, for like um, real world implications, how can black women you know, reduce their exposure to parabens. That's Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Thank you for bringing that up. So um, part of the Bench to Community Initiative is to educate women, to, to let them know that, I mean, I didn't know that a lot of the products have um, a lot of these harmful chemicals, including parabens and many others. And so um, it's to get the word out first that, hey, do you know that these chemicals are in your products, right? And, and, how, and making sure that people feel empowered to you know, have the education to be able to make those decisions and decide I, I want to switch out my products or I don't want to switch out my products. But the other level to that is that there are a lot of um, black owned businesses that are now, so we're also working with people who, have, there's a database, I think it's on our website, there's a database for, um, for um, chemical, like for chemical free um, products that are now coming out um, from black owned businesses. Um, so this is another thing where it's becoming, um, we're seeing more and more um, of this being a thing, right? And people saying, hey, I don't like that these, these chemicals are in here. I don't, I'm not gonna wait for the companies to decide that they're not going to put these chemicals in here anymore. So, you know, why don't we go ahead and make our own products and things like that? So that's why we are in, engaging with salon owners and small business owners and things like that. The other thing I will say is that California is really leading the charge on legislation for removing um, a lot of these chemicals, hazardous chemicals from the personal care products. We have acts um, related to that as well as fragrance. So I didn't talk about it, but anything labeled fragrance is it could be anything. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, while we're waiting for more questions, Dr. Mohan Kumar, I was wondering, um, could you talk a little bit about why do you think um, you saw more effects with the low dose exposure than high dose? Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting thing, actually. Um, you cannot really explain why that is happening, and this happens with uh, not just this chemical alone, multiple chemicals. And so you have this biphasic response that you see sometimes. You typically expect low doses to have lower effects, and then high doses will have a you know increased severity. But that doesn't happen normally with all the chemicals. Mm -hmm. So we see that in different uh, in situations. And the specific reason for us to use uh, low doses is you know people generally try to test what happens with the effects of high doses of these chemicals. And then they can just declare that uh, it doesn't do anything. But then they, they forget about the fact that it could be biphasic. But then lower doses could be even more harmful. We do not know. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to test both this low and high doses. And you know, as you can see, they are well below the uh, regulatory levels, mm -hmm. but still produce uh, significant effects. The other important thing is, you know, in a laboratory environment, you do this in a very controlled setting of one specific chemical, right? But that doesn't happen in, in nature. It's a mixture, right? So number of chemicals are going to happen, and it'll be there. For all I know, maybe paraben is there and everything that we are thinking about, right? So in that situation, so we wanted to see what happens to the mixture. And as you can see, when you put them together, the effects are not exactly the same as what you see in either of those chemicals alone. So. That's, that's the interesting thing. So you cannot just say looking at one thing, okay, it doesn't have any effects or it has effects. You need to look at the whole spectrum. That is the whole purpose of doing that. Okay, thank you. I have a question here. Um, this is for Dr. Torino. What sorts of products contain parabens? Can you give some examples of these? Um, so parabens are used broadly in a lot of different products, but um, it, it could be lotions, uh, shampoos, conditioners. So um, I, 
I think what I've noticed with the paraben free movement is that that's where it started. You know, like in shampoos and conditioners, it'll say paraben free, right? Um, and so it, it really is, it, you can use these apps to like, if you don't want to be checking the product and looking all the time, um, you can use the apps to see where parabens are in the products that you're using because it's widespread. It's uh, facial creams, it's toothpaste, it's, I mean, it, it, they're in everything. And they're also in things that are not personal care products, but our exposure is mainly through that because we use those daily, right? So um, I, I would say that what we tell people is look at the first five ingredients on anything and if you have to look stuff up, like if it's not in the app, you know, look at the first five ingredients. And I mean, if parabens are in there, I don't use paraben uh, pr containing products anymore whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you. Here we have another question. Um, let's see here. Uh, should consumers be concerned about exposure to the BPA substitutes like BPS and BPF as well as BPA? This is for Dr. Mohan Komar. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that, at least based on the results that we, we have seen in our lab in multiple systems. And of course, it depends on uh, the dose and the duration of exposure and things like that. But at least what we have seen in our situations based on our experimental conditions definitely affects multiple systems, including the brain and behavior, cardiovascular function, reproductive function, and immune function, in fact, metabolic function. So multiple systems are affected. So I would be concerned, even though there is a claim that you know the analogs for BPA may not be as bad, at least from what we have seen, it's not the case. Great, uh, is that everything from the chat? All right, wonderful. Well, thank you again to everyone who joined us for today's event. Um, the research was really fascinating. We we're so grateful to our speakers for making the time to join us and um, hope everyone enjoys your time at ENDO 2022. Um, don't forget, tomorrow we'll have news conferences on diabetes at 10 a.m. Eastern and obesity at 11 a.m. Eastern at endowebcasting.com. Thank you.